Fan theories, no matter what the medium or the property involved, are things that can just capture people's imagination. They help to add further depth to existing stories and give people hope that there are bigger things at play that perhaps needed a finer tooth comb to uncover. We saw it in recent times with the rather extensive and imaginative Jar Jar Binks Star Wars theory that had Star Wars enthusiasts going crazy. It had over 66,000 upvotes on Reddit. And over the years, Final Fantasy games have also not been immune to this, albeit to a lesser degree of interest. The Squall's Dead theory, which has been shared over 28,000 times on Facebook, argues that Squall died after being hit by the Ice Shard at the end of Disc 1, and has been heavily debated since it surfaced in 2008. There are also other theories whirling around that suggest that all the Final Fantasy games are interconnected, and in some instances, Square Enix has even addressed this particular topic. Speaking in the Final Fantasy X Part 2 Ultimania guidebook, Nojima revealed that the Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy X universes are connected, as the Shinra Corporation is founded by the descendants of Shinra, who is attempting to harness energy from the far plane through Rin's funding. Final Fantasy XV is also no different on this front, and if anything, due to the somewhat inconsistent narrative, it's actually created even more fan theories as a result. And I'm not just talking about the theories relating to the ending, which of course director Hajime Tabata has conveniently said should be interpreted any way we see fit. No, Final Fantasy XV has some pretty solid theories out there relating to character development and even the wider lore. These are theories where, intentional or accidental, the stars really do align to point to something deeper. And in this video, we're therefore going to be delving into some pretty big spoilers, so consider this your spoiler warning. Also, be sure to subscribe to our channel for more awesome Final Fantasy coverage, and of course, like this video. Alright, let's get this show on the road. My name is Daryl, and here are 5 Final Fantasy XV fan theories that potentially change everything. Starting with The Piteous Ruins, The Story of Ifrit. The Piteous Ruins dungeon is a rather interesting part of Final Fantasy XV. It can only be visited at night, and only if you've obtained the Regalia Type F. On face value, it appears to have been included as a rite of passage, a dungeon that's there to really test your metal and see what you're made of. I mean, aside from acquiring the Black Hood, an accessory that allows Noctis to automatically evade all attacks, where else would they have put such a random dungeon in the game? Well, a husband and wife duo on Reddit, who have the username Perona77, have actually come up with another reason why this dungeon exists, and they believe it's to tell the story of Ifrit, a character who, while only having limited screen time during the campaign, is quite important to the game's lore, and this theory has been going crazy. To summarise things a little, the theory argues that the Piteous Ruins, through the various statues, puzzles and events that you encounter as you navigate it, is there to tell a story of Ifrit's love for Eos. It also proposes that Ifrit isn't actually the bad guy that he's perceived to be, and that he unintentionally prevented the world from being destroyed. It would take quite a while to delve too much into this theory as it spans numerous chapters and is very extensive, but it's extremely well researched, and one loading screen from episode Gladiolus that's just been released also seems to kind of go along with it. I definitely implore you to check out the full thing, so there's a link in the description below. Prompto's mother and brother. Prompto's backstory is rather shrouded with mystery, but as you reach the game's conclusion, things start to make a bit more sense. During chapter 13, Arden starts to allude that Prompto isn't quite what he seems, and we learn that instead of being Lucian born, he's actually from Niflheim and was one of the Empire's tester babies. In the guidebook, it's also revealed that the Stahl, the evil chief scientist of the Niflheim Empire, is his biological father. But there are some theories around that help to expand even more about Prompto's backstory, the first of which came via a Tumblr user called Space Pirate Captain Sexy. The theory proposes that the Naga you encounter on the way to obtain Ramu is in fact Prompto's mother. During the dungeon there are some rather specific actions that take place, such as the Naga kidnapping Prompto and then talking about her baby. And due to the fact that the Star Scourge infects humans and eventually turns them into demons, the theory proposes that after giving birth to Prompto, his mother became the Naga in the dungeon. I definitely recommend you check out the supporting video we made on this theory to find out more about it because it's actually quite interesting. Another theory that's a bit more off the wall is proposed by a Tumblr user called Teal Aqua Chan. They believe that Loki is Prompto's brother. Many people have noted that there is a resemblance in the designs, but this theory proposes that when Loki is introduced, there is a specific intention to focus on his jawline. It highlights a mole that is almost identical to one that Prompto has, and there are other features that are quite similar too. They're also, of course, both from Niflheim. I will admit this rumour is a tad on the unlikely side, but it would still be rather interesting and it's a nice supporting theory to the mother one. Ravis's visual change if you look at the Ravers who appeared in Kingsclave and the Ravers who appeared in Final Fantasy XV, outside of the clothing, you could conceivably be looking at two different characters. 
And according to a theory proposed by Tumblr user Demon of Niflheim, this was very much intentional. The theory suggests that following the failed attempt to wear the Ring of the Luciae and his subsequent magitic arm appendage, he changed physically. Between the two properties, you can see that Ravis' hairstyle and colour are different. His face has also changed with sharper features and he looks younger. The biggest change, however, comes with his eyes, as he's gained heterochromia. In Kingsglaive, his irises are the same colour, but in Final Fantasy XV, they are no longer the same. The eye that's on the side of the body that has the magitech arm now has a purple iris, which matches the rest of his clothing. You could put this down to a graphical discrepancy, but it's also featured in the concept art for Final Fantasy XV and not in the concept art for Kingsglaive, which makes this theory quite compelling. Noctis's alternate timeline. The ending of Final Fantasy XV has had quite a few people talking, and as I mentioned in the introduction, Hajime Tabada has stated that he left it quite open so that people can interpret it how they wish, and one Reddit user called Sonic Kestrel has done just that with his theory about what the ending actually means. Right at the end of the game, there was a special scene that contained Noctis and Luna Freya, and while some people have speculated that this takes place in the afterlife, Sonic Kestrel disagrees, as he feels it actually takes place in a new timeline. Now, there was a lot of contention about this theory, and many people pointed at things that can disprove it, but the two pieces of evidence that they used were that 1. The car sequence that plays at the beginning also plays at the ending, suggesting that the timeline has reset, and that 2. After Arden is defeated, he mentions about Noctis erasing him from history. In the comments, a user called Bnerd also added that Arden mentions erasing him again from history. He points out that it's somewhat strange that none of the previous kings knew who Arden was, so it suggests that the timeline has been rewritten. It's perhaps not quite as ironclad as some other theories, and people have pointed out some inconsistencies, but it's still interesting nonetheless. However, the last theory somewhat supersedes it, and that is about Final Fantasy XV being Arden's story. This last theory also comes via Reddit, and it was proposed by a user called Calaray, and then expanded upon by Tanuji and it's about the role that Arden Azunia has within the story. As we know, Arden's story starts around 2000 years ago, when he was known as Arden Lucis Calum. He had the ability to heal the darkness in people, but it unfortunately started to corrupt him, and instead of rewarding him for his sacrifice, the Crystal of Light rejected him, cursing him to roam the land as a soul shrouded in darkness. Given the fact that he cannot die, his only course of action is to therefore strike down those who betrayed him. The Crystal, and the Lucian bloodline, who were favoured by the crystal instead of him. It paints Arden as a very sinister character, but the theory proposes that Arden is just as much the hero of Final Fantasy XV as Noctis, and that he has been fighting against himself and the Lucian bloodline for peace all this time. Following his rejection by the crystal, Arden was ostracised by what he claims was the Jealous King, and they made him out to be a monster. This continued for generations, so he had to disappear until a time when nobody knew of his origins. However, during this time, as Muhammad mentions, he became twisted by spite and bent on revenge. But deep down, there was still good in him. To justify this, the theory points to the scene with Luna Freya, where he is accepting of her help, but then suddenly reacts negatively as the darkness pulls him away. Tanuji's extension to this story takes things further, stating that Final Fantasy XV is Arden's story. They talk about how the timeline of the game starts with Arden, that he is the one who forced the Empire to act, that he is the one who leads Noctis to become the one true king, and that he is the one who sees about the fall of the Empire, ending conflicts. In summary, pretty much everything that happens in the game, good or bad, uses Arden as a conduit. He is the ultimate puppet master, and without him, the world wouldn't have been saved. So, which of these theories do you think is the most compelling? And do you think there are any others that we might have missed? Let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe. If you'd like to support our channel, please head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ffunion. These awesome folks have already done so, so why not join them? Alright, thanks for watching everyone, this is Daryl signing out. I'll see you next time.